And we are live. Hello, everyone. I am Tom Ballard, the groundwater guy. <clears throat> and uh, let me just adjust my sound here a little bit. And uh, we'll... We got some sound coming in from somewhere else, so we're getting an echo. So one of those live things. All right. <clears throat> I think we're good to go. So once again, I am Tom Ballard, the groundwater guy at Southeast Hydrogeology, <clears throat> and we are going to uh, welcome to the show today. We got an interesting show, I think. We're going to talk a little bit about corrosion, but uh, um, before, I, before I get going, I had a couple questions on, on some things that, uh, that I wanted to uh, clear up is... We uh, groundwater talk live is is part of uh, we fall into all under the umbrella of Southeast Hydrogeology, which is uh, my consulting company, and we also have Groundwater Academy where we do training. So you'll see that as well. And uh, I use the moniker of of uh, the groundwater guy, so uh, you can see that. And uh, that's. <clears throat> Part, part of the thing is, is we all have our company names and, and they tend to be boring and, and nobody remembers them. So, but everybody remembers the groundwater guys. So, so I tend to use that a lot. It's, it's a little bit whimsical, but, but it sticks in people's memory better than, than uh, saying Southeast Hydrogeology, which they forget um, 10 seconds after you say it. So, so that's kind of why we have all, everything uh, set up that way. But, but we do the we do this show every every week and and try to provide some information out there. We also do some paid training through uh, 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 Groundwater Academy, and that is part of uh, Southeast Hydrogeology as well. And then uh, we do the consulting through Southeast Hydrogeology, and and so it's all under the under the same umbrella of Southeast Hydrogeology. In case anybody had any questions about that, so uh, with that. Um, I wanted to put in a plug for uh, uh, a Groundwater Academy class we have coming up here. We're going to do uh, next week on November 16th. We're going to do the well health check process for diagnosing well problems. This is going to be a one-hour training event. Uh, there, there will be contact hours available for water system operators. We do provide certificates for that. Uh, for the state of California, we will provide... Uh, uh, certificates of participation for people from other jurisdictions. So uh, stop in and, and do that. The uh, the URL to register for that is there. It's forty nine dollars for an hour or so uh, of training, and we tend to pack a lot into our training. So it's it's a it's a a full one hour. So there's not a lot of fluff in the stuff we do. Uh, anybody that's taken any of our training in the past knows that. Is it you? You get, a, you get a pretty good bang for your buck on that. So I wanted to let everybody know that's coming up next Tuesday, uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 11 a.m. Central time. And, and there is the URL to, to join that. So put in that little, little shameless plug there. All right. Today our topic is corrosion in, in, uh, in water wells. And uh, you can see here, well, let me uh, point here. Uh, this is just one example. I got uh, a ton of pictures of the of different uh, effects of corrosion, and a lot of I look at a lot of well videos, and and certainly that's something that uh, we see a lot of, and and uh, that's uh, it's a big problem out there, and and understanding corrosion and what to do about it is really an important part of, of properly managing your well, and it all starts with the design. But we're going to talk today a little bit about what corrosion is. Um, how you determine if you have corrosion going on, what are the indicators and predictors of corrosion, uh, and, and some other things that we're going to talk about, what you do about that. And, and then uh, I got some information sources for you as well. So, so it's, uh, it, it should be, uh, you know, some pretty good information here. I will say that uh, the, our Groundwater Academy, we are going to be doing some classes. They'll probably be good to go after the first of the year. We're going to do one on biofouling and one on corrosion too. So so those will be available for, for contact hour credits uh, coming up. So so I think that that'll be interesting. And, and But this this will give you a little taste today so you can see what's going on. And, and uh, uh, but, but uh, we got a a lot of information for you here. So, so, and but before we do that, let me just say, if you're uh, if you're listening live, if you can drop a comment in the chat so we know you're here, 
I am now using a uh, restream, which allows me to bring the uh, chats on on uh, the, the the program here. So so that's that's kind of good. So I can see them and not have to be looking over here and and monitoring the the, the chat and and uh, so so that's good. Although I will say on LinkedIn comments, I can't see there there must be some way you can set it up so the so it'll uh push through the uh the username so so um so i i can see the comment but i can't necessarily see the the uh the person so so um and anyway that that's kind of that's kind of what that looks like right there so so uh this is actually steve steeg i can look on the screen and, and see that but uh um anyway there, there you go. That's that. Okay. Well, let's dive in on, on the topic for today. We're talking corrosion. So if we go to Wikipedia and look and see the formal definition of corrosion, it's a natural process that converts a refined metal into a more chemically stable form, such as oxide, hydroxide, um, <clears throat> carbonate, or, or sulfide. It's the gradual destruction of materials, usually a metal, by a chemical and or electrochemical reaction with their environment. <clears throat> we're, we're probably getting in the electrochemical realm and, and the biochemical realm when we're talking uh, uh, corrosion of water wells. Uh, but but here's, here's the deal is natural metals like, uh, uh, for instance, refined steel, is not the natural state of the metal. It wants to be something else. So corrosion is that natural process that breaks it down back into a more stable form. So, so it is a natural process that goes on. So what we're doing in corrosion control is trying to inhibit those natural processes as long as possible. Eventually, they're going to catch up with us. All wells will, uh, will have a lifespan that they, uh, that they, that they go through and, and they eventually succumb to the natural processes, but but uh, corrosion control, there's a whole science of that is, and there's there's papers written on it and training available, and I'll give you some of those information sources later, but corrosion control is a huge deal, not just in water wells, but bridges, your, your whole distribution system, uh, anything where there's metal on metal contact, you now have corrosion issues, or, or you have metal at, uh, at all, you're going to have corrosion issues. So, so it's a huge deal out there, not just water wells, it, it's everywhere. Okay, so water well corrosion, we're, there, there's a lot of different forms of corrosion out there, but we're mainly interested in two different types of corrosion. The first one is galvanic corrosion, which is an electrochemical corrosion process, and and it's it's a that's kind of the biggie uh, metal on metal type of corrosion, and the second one that that a lot of people don't think about a lot, but is really a, a huge deal and can can influence your well a lot. So, uh, um, <clears throat> it's a uh, hey Steve, shout out to Steve for for dropping in, and uh, watching the show. Uh, so. Microbial in influence corrosion, which is kind of a mouthful, so we just call it MIC, is uh, so MIC is a lot bigger deal than a lot of people think. And so we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. But but here's really what we're looking at for for galvanic cor corrosion is it occurs when there's two different metals that have physical or electrical contact with each other and they're immersed in a common electrolyte. Well, that electrolyte we're dealing with in our situation is is groundwater so so that is the electrolyte that, that gets that process going you can have dry dry corrosion going on in the air that's not something we're we're generally interested in when it comes to water wells we're interested in what's going on uh, under the water and and so water is our electrolyte and so we have and and we'll dive into this more in more detail in, in our class there's just not enough time here today to to, to do that, but but there's a there is charts and 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 really that show the elect uh, the electrochemical potential in, in electron volts of or voltage of different types of metals. So it's, there's a priority ranking. So metals will corrode and degrade when a higher potential metal is in contact with the lower potential metal. 
And so the, the metals will then create an electrochemical circuit that will move uh, from the lower potential metal to the higher potential metal. And that's usually where you get uh, things like rust and, and that type of thing. So, so that's, that's what's going on there. And so this is why one of the solutions we'll talk about a little bit later really is you don't want to have, for instance, uh, stainless steel in contact with uh, with something like a mild steel direct contact that is a electrochemical corrosion circuit for sure and that's where you're going to develop uh, corrosion so well so that's that's a common mistake we see in, in design and like I say we'll talk about that more towards the end here after we go through everything but but really you don't want that uh, saving money sometimes on that thing is not worth it because you shorten the life of your well by saving money and putting those things in contact with each other. It's a real common design flaw that we see out there and and people think they're they're saving money but but you're basically creating a problem for yourself. So so that's how galvanic cor uh, corrosion works. It's it's a lower potential metal to higher potential metal. So so your lower potential metal in this case would be mild steel and stainless steel would be your higher potential metal. So what's going to happen is the corrosion circuit is going to go from from the mild steel to the stainless steel and and that's 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 how that's going to work. So that is galvanic corrosion. So uh, MIC or mi microbiologically influenced corrosion, which is a mouthful, uh, is is a corrosion that's is basically induced by by bacteria in the well. There are certain types of bacteria out there, and these are going to be your sulfur reducing bacteria and your your acid producing bacteria out there. We're probably familiar with the the SRBs or sulfur producing or sulfur reducing bacteria, but those are going to create a, a, a corrosion situation as well as, as part of their byproduct of, of metabolizing certain uh, constituents in, in the groundwater. So that's going to, to um, uh, basically, there's, there's two types of environments we're going to have in the well. One is going to be your reducing or anaerobic conditions or low oxygen conditions. And the other is going to be aerobic or oxidizing or, or higher oxygen situation. There's going to be certain bacteria that are going to thrive in, in, in either of those situations. There's going to be anaerobic bacteria, aerobic bacteria. There are some bacteria that do fine in, in either situation, but uh, we're, we're trying to differentiate between aerobic and anaerobic. So, so really, uh, corrosion is more common under reductive conditions uh, where sulfates are, are present. And so that, that generates hydrogen sulfide gas, and that's usually going to be your, your sulfur-reducing bacteria are going to do that. And where organics are present in, in your groundwater. So we want to look at the total organic carbon and that type of thing to, to assess that. And the, those are going to be your acid-producing bacteria, or APBs. And those are going to generate acids as well that will that will weaken and and, and uh, make your casing more more brittle and subject to to failure. Now on the flip side, we have our oxidative conditions or aerobic or, or more uh, oxygen rich conditions. And in those situations, you can have sulfur and sulfides can be oxidized to sulfuric acid, which will also attack your your casing and screen. Uh, and and uh, make them brittle and, and more subject to failure and and uh, corrode them over time. So so you can have it, it's going to be depend on the type of bacteria, but but the environment either aerobic or anaerobic is going to have certain bacteria that are going to operate in that environment, and it's important to understand what kind of bacteria you have and what what damage they can do for you and keep those under under control. So. So there you go. There, there's a summary of, of galvanic corrosion and MIC. Those are the two main types of corrosion we're going to get in, in water wells. There are some other ones out there, but, but it's important to, to understand. Those, those are our biggies, and that's really what we're focusing on here today. All right, so corrosion indicators. We have a number of factors that indicate if you have potentially corrosive situations in your well. So the first of those is dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is is really huge. It's uh, it's something that that is is uh, is going to create a 
oxidative condition or, or, or an aerobic condition. So uh, subject to, to oxidation in the wells, and that's, that's going to create a corrosive environment. Uh, generally, we're going to see dissolved oxygen that is, that is greater than two milligrams per liter is really going to indicate a corrosive uh, situation in your well. So it's one of the things we want to monitor uh, during during the process of, of uh, monitoring our wells. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit too. But, but it is important to, to understand that some of the things we're looking at here that are indicators of corrosion may not necessarily be things you would analyze for for your normal water quality monitoring that, that you report to the to the state or the county. Uh, we're talking about kind of above and beyond to see what what's going on in in your well, so the health of your well, and so some of these things are going to be things you may not necessarily monitor, but but they are important factors, and and we're pointing it out here to you today, so you know. What the, what they are and and what you need to monitor for, and we'll we'll talk about that more in a little bit. <clears throat> okay, the second one is pH. Of course, pH is huge. Uh, a pH of seven is considered neutral. Uh, generally, there's going to be uh, you know a range of about uh, six point five, seven point five, and there's going to be be your normal range, maybe six to to eight. Is probably not too much of a concern, but but when you get down below seven, that's going to be considered an acidic environment, and the lower you go, the more acidic it's going to be. So uh, acidic environment is considered to be a corrosive environment. So we want to pay attention to the pH in our well because a low pH, and we've seen some uh, here in Tennessee, for instance. Uh, I just talked to some people, and, and it's fairly normal around here to have a pH of about 5.5 in your well. So that's definitely acidic, and it's it's something that that, uh, that you gotta monitor because it, it does produce acid and, and is corrosive in your well. So if you have a low pH, then you're really gonna have to monitor the uh, what's going on in your well to, uh, because it's, it's gonna be a corrosive environment, one factor. Hydrogen sulfide, we talked about here a little bit, but but hydrogen sulfide is 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 something that uh, gets produced by the sulfur reducing bacteria. Uh, you can actually have natural hydrogen sulfide. So if you have a lot of organics in your well, we've seen wells where where we went through zones where we there was a bunch of wood chips and things like that where we got hydrogen sulfide associated with that. So so you can have naturally occurring hydrogen sulfide. Um, most of the hydrogen sulfide we're going to see in wells is is going to be generated by by microbes or or it's going to going to be MIC related uh, type types of uh, a situation. So uh, hydrogen sulfide corrosive. It can also um, enhance galvanic corrosion. So so a couple couple situations there. Hydrogen sulfide is bad. It's it's poisonous as well. So so you definitely want to if, if you have MIC related hydrogen sulfide, it's definitely something you want to do something about and you want to monitor that. So total dissolved solids. Now uh, TDS is something we you normally monitor in your well as part of water quality. Uh, usually under 500 milligrams per liter is considered to be drinking water standards. Although we see some some wells where, where maybe you have uh, uh, up to a thousand. You get over a thousand, you start to get into the brackish territory. So you may have some ag wells, for instance, that that, uh, that get in that range. So so certainly if you're over a thousand TDS, that's going to be brackish and considered to be uh, cor a corrosive environment in, in your well. So so we definitely want to look at those those TDS numbers. For the most part, most water wells are going to be under that 500 range because that that's certainly something that uh, uh, that uh, uh, that is drinking water standards. But but TDS can certainly be treated, and so the natural water coming into the well might be relatively high in TDS or at least above the 500. And it gets treated down to below 500, and so if your natural water coming in is is uh, uh, greater than a thousand TDS, then then yes, that is a a, a, a conducive environment for uh, for corrosion. Uh, next up is carbon dioxide. 
um, high carbon dioxide in your well will combine with the water to produce a weak acid called carbonic acid. And actually, uh, it, it's a naturally occurring thing. We see it a lot in, in uh, karst environments where, where uh, rainwater uh, picks up carbon dioxide as, as, it, uh, as precipitation occurs. It hits the, uh, hits the ground and it goes into the limestone and then it dissolves out the limestone. And that's how a lot of caves are formed from the action of, of the weak carbonic acid that's formed from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Well, the same thing goes for your, for your well. If you have uh, a situation in your in your well where where you have high carbon dioxide, now you're producing uh, low levels of carbonic acid. It is a weak acid, but it will uh, contribute to to corrosive effects, especially if you have some other things going on a, as well. So so it's important to monitor carbon dioxide levels in your well, and that's certainly not something we normally monitor for for water quality, but but it can indicate a, a corrosive environment as well. All right, chlorides, probably not too much in the in the situation where where we have uh, drinking water wells. You can get into brackish situations. So um, if you have high chlorides, which is greater than 500 milligrams per liter, now you're into a corrosive environment. So so certainly, if we have uh, um, uh, wells where we're doing uh, uh, on the coast where, where we're doing the, um, uh, the uh, saline wells, where, where we're doing reverse osmosis on those. We uh, desalination plants, for instance, uh, a lot of times we use saline water and they'll have wells for that. Uh, it, um, you can get high chloride. That's going to be highly corrosive. And certainly you're going to use uh, stainless steel on those wells and probably the higher a uh, 316 as opposed to a 304 stainless steel. So, so the highest grade of stainless steel and you'll still have, have some issues because chlorides tend to be uh, very corrosive. We talked a little bit about uh, sulfur reducing bacteria and certainly sulfur, uh, sulfur reducing bacteria or SRBs for, for short. Uh, will produce the hydrogen sulfide gas. They're usually an anaerobic type of bacteria, so they, uh, they operate in, in the uh, lower oxygen zones in, in your well. So usually deeper in the well, but they can grow underneath uh, so the other pest, uh, the, the iron-related bacteria. So you can get kind of a, uh, a situation where, where you have the SRBs growing underneath the, the IRBs, and, and they have the environment that, that is uh, conducive to, to grow. They will produce the hydrogen sulfide gas as a byproduct uh, from, from metabolizing uh, sulfates in the, in the uh, uh, sulfur and sulfates in the, in the groundwater. And then will, they will produce hydrogen sulfide gas as part of that normal metabolic process. And, and so that's uh, sulfur reducing bacteria is something we really want to monitor and, and watch in the well. And last month, we, or, or last week in, in Groundwater Talk Live, we actually talked about using bark tests and, and some simple tests for, for monitoring for, for these types of, of bacteria. And, and if you haven't seen that show, I'd go back and look at that because we, we go through that in, in, uh, in pretty great detail on, on, on that. So, so I think it might, might be of interest to you if, if you have issues with uh, uh, SRBs in your well. And lastly, we have uh, the presence of acid-producing bacteria. This is going to be uh, different than, than the sulfur-reducing bacteria. So IPBs uh, tend to produce a, uh, they tend to produce acid in the, in the presence of, of, uh, of organic material in your well. So you're going to want to look at things like, like uh, tannins. You're going to want to look at things like total organic carbon in your well. Once again, these are things that we don't normally monitor in, in groundwater wells. Uh, now, uh, surface water sources will norm normally monitor for organics because when they chlorinate, they will, they will run into issues with, uh, um, uh, with um, uh, hydroxyacetic acids and, and, uh, um, and, and disinfectant byproducts from from uh, organics in, in the well and, and the chlorination process. So, so surface water sources normally look at, at uh, organics in the well, but, but groundwater wells typically aren't looking at that unless you have some sort of problem and people are trying to track it down. But, 
but it can be uh, a situation where if you have organic content in your well water, then you might have the presence of APBs that, that are going to produce that, that acid that is, it's not going to be as destructive as the hydrogen sulfide from SRBs, but it's certainly going to be a situation where, where it's going to produce a more acidic environment in the well, and the long-term exposure of metal to an acidic environment is going to make that metal brittle and subject it to failure. Uh, so any pressure on that, it, you can see some some uh, failure, and, and that may build up to the point where you just get sudden failure in your well and cracks develop, and, and you need to fix that. So so that's, that's another thing to, to monitor as well. All right, a few words on on iron, and iron is another is another indicator actually that, that we want to want to look at, but it kind of falls into its own category. Now, when we talk about the difference between water quality monitoring and monitoring for well health, uh, including a corrosion situation, uh, most most uh, you're required for water quality monitoring to monitor total iron. Uh, there's a secondary MCL for, for total iron, so we're required to monitor for that. And that's usually as far as people go. But, but if you're interested in corrosion and the well health situation, now you're really want, going to want to look at the fact that the uh, iron is really, uh, total iron is going to be made up of, of two main uh, um, uh, types of iron. One is going to be ferrous iron, or iron 2, as we call it, um, uh, and ferric iron, or iron 3. So, so what that really means is the iron, uh, the iron, iron 2, is missing two electrons. So, so there's two, two empty um, electron orbits that can be filled by electrons, and that's how iron tends to combine with, with other elements to, to form uh, the, uh, the rust, the stable, the, the, the oxygen or the hydroxides or, or some of those things that are byproducts of, of corrosion. So uh, iron-3 then has three empty electron orbits, and, and that's why the, the three. So, so it's, a, it's a situation where we have these two species of iron, and they, whether you have one or the other in your well means certain situations. Uh, we are has certain implications to, to, to the corrosive environment in your well. We want to pay attention to the iron too, especially since it's indicative of corrosion. And so we want to track that over time. This is something that most people don't do on a regular basis because they're only looking at total iron. And total iron can, can help, but but if it's iron three, if it if the, if your total iron content the number is 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 really made up of only iron three, then then you may not have a corrosive situation. So we want to dive a little deeper, and this is a relatively inexpensive analysis. So so it's 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 a good number to have, and tracking the trend over time. If you see your iron two content going up in the well over time. That's generally going to be indicative of ongoing corrosion in your well. So, so that's that's probably a, as good an indicator as there is. Now, we certainly want to look at some of these other ones we just mentioned, and so that's that's uh, that's going to be you know you want going to want to look at things in total. I'm always a fan of the more indicators, the better. Some things we, we really like and we, we pay attention to, but but these other things can can kind of factor in because sometimes certain geochemical situations in your well can mask some of these responses. So, so it's a really important to look at multiple factors when, when you're really assessing the, the health of, of your well. Okay, and uh, just for, for a little humor here, everybody's heard of a Ferris wheel. So, you know, Ferris iron, Ferris wheel. So, so there you go, a little bit of bad chemistry humor, but, uh, but uh, I, I could not resist to, to put a little bit of levity in here. So. All right, um, <clears throat> once again, just a reminder, if, if you're watching live, if you can drop your comments and, and questions in the chat, I'd be happy to, to answer them for you or if we can hone in on something for you, just let me know and, and uh, just drop those in and, and I appreciate that. All right, corrosion predictors. We have, we have a few tests here that, that we can do to, to predict corrosion. And these are going to be your Langelier Saturation Index, or LSI, 
And that's probably the most common test we do when we're looking at, uh, especially during the design phase on a well. When we drill our, our initial well, we're going to do an LSI on that well to, to see how corrosive the, the environment is. Uh, the RISNAR index is, is another one that's real similar to the LSI. And lastly, we have the, uh, the, the qualitative uh, nail test, and I'll, I'll show you that here, here in a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a pretty clever test, uh, certainly not invented here, but uh, I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. And, and it, it, it can give you a, a good indicator. But, but first, let's, let's look at the LSI because that's probably the most common one that, that's used out there. Now, the LSI is a, is a calculated index which predicts the scaling or corrosivity of water based on the cal calcium carbonate, carbonate equilibrium values. So it's going to be calculated using pH, temperature, TDS, or, or uh, usually conductivity in place of TDS. So, so we use conductivity as, as an equivalent for, for uh, direct measurement of, of TDS. Um, <clears throat> alkalinity in, in the well and, and uh, calcium hardness. So those are the five factors we use to calculate the Langelier saturation index. Uh, you can, if you have those numbers, you can calculate it yourself. There are some online calculators available. I think the American Water Works Association has one and, and just a quick <clears throat> online search can, can really uh, uh, find an LSI calculator for you if, if you wanna do that. But. But it's relatively inexpensive if you're running those things to, to have the lab run run an LSI if, if they've already got all those other things. If not, those all the all the constituents are, are relatively inexpensive to run. So so an LSI is not not uh, uh, not not an expensive analysis. And we typically run these when when we're drilling our, our, our test well because the LSI is going to be important when we do our final well design. And so we want to know how corrosive the environment is we're, we're going into and, and we can do certain things in our well and, and maybe modify the design if we're seeing we have, have an LSI that, that's, that's a little out of whack. And so, but the LSI does two things. It's looking at both the scaling or mineral encrustations and it's looking at corrosivity potential. So, so it's a good index. <coughs> um, and the way it works is if the actual pH of the water is below the calculated pH S, or the saturation pH, uh, then the LSI is, is negative. So, so a negative uh, LSI indicates that the water will dissolve calcium carbonate and that it will be corrosive, particularly if we have oxygen present. Remember I told you the oxygen combines with the iron to... to produce iron oxide and, and that's going to be your, your rust and, and, and other, other things can combine with the iron as well. But, but oxygen is certainly going to be uh, move along that, that corrosion uh, pretty well. Remember I mentioned that dissolved oxygen is, is really a good indicator of, of a corrosive environment. Although DO does not <clears throat> enter into the LSI calculation, uh, that's why you want to look at some of these things in, in total because uh, the presence of oxygen can enhance your your LSI, uh, especially if it's negative and and produce a, a, a corrosive environment. So so using the LSI in conjunction with your DO numbers can can really help you dial in that that uh, corrosion. Okay, if the actual pH of water is higher than the calculated saturation pH then the LSI is positive, and that indicates you're likely to develop mineral encrustations in your well. So it's, it's going to precipitate out calcium carbonate and, and other, uh, other elements and, and form uh, uh, mineral encrustations in your well. So, so a uh, positive LSI is going to indicate that, that uh, you have potential for, for uh, scaling in your well. Okay, so in summary, a negative LSI indicates you have corrosion potential in your well. A positive LSI indicates you have scaling or, or mineral encrustation potential in your well. So, so it's a valuable tool. Like I said, it's not expensive to run. So 
we like to run these uh, right up front when we're when we're building a new well, so we know what we're dealing with. But but monitoring this as you go along uh, is, is important because things can change over time, and understanding the corrosive environment of your well is is important for for ongoing management of, of that well and, and and dealing with these situations. All right, the Risner Index, similar to to the uh, uh, to the LSI, it once again predicts predicts the tendency for scaling and corrosion uh, it 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 could use probably not as much as the LSI but but the way the Risner uh, uh, index works it's it's once again kind of a calculated thing it's it's looking at um, uh, the calcium carbonate saturation so you're looking at your regular pH of, of your groundwater and you're comparing that to saturation level calcium carbonate in your water. And that difference is going to give you give you a number, so uh, at that ratio, and so um, so well actually the, the the number it's it's calculated it's subtracting one from the other. So so water is corrosive if if the Risner index is higher than seven, and it has uh, potential for mineral encrustations if it's less than seven. So so kind of the flip of of the uh, of the LSI. But uh, it's it's uh, once again uh, uh, an indicator there as, as well. So, like I say, I don't see the Risner run as much as the LSI, but sometimes they're both run together, and and so it's it's useful. Now the LSI can can have some some challenges. So so that number in and of itself can can have some issues. So so maybe running the Risner as well, and and looking at some of these other factors together. Don't just rely on one thing alone. Is is really what I'm saying. All right, so let's talk about the nail test here. And, and the nail test is actually very simple here. Um, and this, this was actually, uh, we call it a, a qualitative test rather than quantitative. So it's not going to give you any numeric numbers. Uh, so it's not higher than or less than. It's just kind of observations. But real simple test developed by John Schneiders at Water Systems Engineering in Kansas, who I highly recommend. They're a great outfit. I'll give you their, their contact information a little bit later. Uh, they do work on corrosion and, and also microbiology in, in wells, and, and so they're, they're the experts on that. But, but they developed this test, and, it, and it's, it's really a simple test just to kind of get an indication of how corrosive you are. So, so it really requires three things. One, a common nail. So, so here we go. Here's a nail. This is a ten penny common nail, uh, and and then we have a, a glass or a beaker if if you want uh, to make if you want to make it look scientific. We put the nail in the glass. So so there we go. There's the nail in the glass, and we we fill this up with with our well water, and so we take a direct sample. We fill this up, and then we see how long it takes for for the nail to to rust. If the nail starts rusting right away, if you see that little pink in there and, and the rusting uh, indications of rusting in there, now we know we have a pretty corrosive environment. If you run for a week and you don't have any rust, then you have a, a pretty low uh, corrosive environment. So, so very simple test, but but it is indicative of of a uh, of corrosive environment in the well. Uh, obviously very easy to do everybody's got a nail and a glass so so it's a uh, it's easy to do and and so uh I, I i like this and you know we ran this on on even some of our city water here just to see what what it would do to our pipes and and so it was, so it was interesting to see so <clears throat> anyhow um that that's that that's just an indicator um we tend to prefer if, if you want numeric values to to run the lsi or the the risner index and and that's going to give you your your numbers that you need to to really dial things in. But but once again, any of these tests alone, there are certain factors that are going to distort them, and that's one of the critiques of the of the LSI, uh, the Langlier Saturation Index, is that that there are some things that can throw it off. So so looking at other things like dissolved oxygen, iron content, and and those things as well is is really really important if you really want to understand the the current corrosive environment in your well and, and overall well health. So, all right. 
So preventing galvanic corrosion, we're, we're going to break this out into preventing galvanic corrosion and also look at, at uh, uh, the MIC, the microbiologically influenced corrosion. Uh, so first we'll look at uh, preventing galvanic corrosion. And really, this is the importance of running those LSI and really looking at your water quality uh, when, when you build your well. And understanding that because that's going to tell you how corrosive an environment are and a lot of it is going to be proper well design we're really going to want to look at at how corrosive in your, your environment is and whether you um, have a corrosive situation and you can design around that and and really uh, really use the the materials in your well that are going to be right right for the situation so we want to understand the water chemistry before we design the well. We want to run the LSI. Uh, we're going to want to look at uh, the, the, uh, the dissolved oxygen, the pH, and, and some of that other chemistry we talked about so that we know what's going on in the well. The, the, uh, the bacteria issue, those will come later. Um, you're probably not going to get too much of an indication of, of a uh, MIC type of environment when you first build your well because it's going to take a while for those bacteria to move in. Uh, wells tend to produce a conducive environment for bacterial growth. So so right up front, you're probably not going to get a good indication of, of, the, uh, of the bacteria. So that's probably not going to be something you're going to uh, look at right up front. But certainly things like dissolved oxygen, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, TDS and, and all those other things that we talked about earlier are going to be things you're going to want to look at and and then the LSI and maybe the Risner index as, as well and and uh, understand your water chemistry. Now if we know if we have a corrosive environment we can really design that well uh, and and select the proper materials for the conditions. And a lot of times this is going to be if you have a corrosive environment then it's a no-brainer to use stainless steel. Um, it's it's something that uh, that uh, we want to look at and and a lot of times if we look at the total lifespan of the well you know and and expanding out over time a lot of people are looking at what the total upfront cost is and the bid cost on building that well but but a lot of times it's important to understand that that what's really important is the total cost of that well over its lifespan not the initial upfront cost because if you build a cheap well and you have to rehab it all the time and you're having to fix it and it doesn't last as long as a more expensive well, then what does that well really cost you over its lifespan? So, so a lot of times the most expensive well up front ends up being the cheapest well over its lifespan. So, so the, uh, the life cycle costs, as Marvin Glotfelty uh, says, is, is really important. So, so that's, so Kind of looking at that is we can understand what the corrosive environment and the water chemistry is as we design our well and then really select the proper materials for, for the job. Now, at a minimum, if you must use different metals, so if you're using, for instance, a stainless steel screen and more of a mild steel uh, casing, some people do that to save money. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's the best situation, but... But you can, but I see, do see people do that. But what you don't want to do, because you're going to create a galvanic corrosion circuit, is you don't want to weld uh, stainless steel directly to, to mild steel. That is just a recipe for disaster, and you're, and you're guaranteed to get corrosion. So if you're going to do that, then they make uh, most uh, um, case uh, people where, where you can buy your casing from, Johnson Screens, for instance, uh, they... They have provide, you can buy these dielectric couplers from them. So it basically separates the two dissimilar metals, breaks that corrosion circuit, and prevents uh, the, uh, the galvanic corrosion circuit from, from developing. So, so at the minimum, if you're going to use different metals, if you decide to go that route, and I generally advise going all stainless if you're in a corrosive environment, but, but if you're going to go that route, you're going to want to use the dielectric couplers. Do not directly weld uh, stainless and mild steel together. It's only going to create 
uh, problems for you down the road. So whatever money you save, you're going to waste in, in well repairs and an early failure of that, of that well. So, so my advice is just don't do that. Okay, preventing uh, MIC, the, the microbiologically influenced uh, corrosion. Monitoring your bacterial populations is your in your well is important. So, so it, over time, you're going to develop these bacterial populations in the well. And as I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, uh, a, a, a well is a conducive environment for, for bacterial growth. You're kind of changing the natural environment by putting in a well and pumping water out of it, you're oxygenating it, you're creating uh, an anaerobic uh, uh, environment in your well lower down, an aerobic environment in your well higher up, and that's going to be all create a situation where bacteria can, can thrive in the well. There's naturally going to be bacteria in groundwater, and they're going to come into the well, and if there's a conducive environment there, they are going to grow over time, and it's important to monitor those. A couple ways of doing that. Um, we, we talked last week about the BART test. It's, it's a relatively inexpensive and easy-to-use test for monitoring different classes of bacteria. They have a BART test for, for uh, iron-related bacteria. They have a BART test for sulfur-reducing bacteria, acid-producing bacteria, and BART tests for a lot of different ty types of bacteria classes. We recommend running that uh, at least once a year, uh, probably quarterly, and, and track the trends on that. And that'll allow you to determine if that class of bacteria is present in the well and how aggressive there are, they are. It's a, it's a semi-quantitative uh, test, uh, and it's, it's, it's not a lab test, but, but it gives you a great indication. The second one that, that, that we do for, for folks is, is the well health check process, and, and that's a deeper dive. We're really looking at all these situations where, where we're looking at things like dissolved oxygen, organics. We're actually getting out there and, and uh, uh, we work with water systems engineering that I mentioned earlier, and we'll give you their contact information a little bit later. We work on them to actually speciate the bacteria so we know what, what bacteria there are in the, in the well, and, and, uh, and so we can understand what, what our environment is and, and, and what our potential is for, is for corrosion and other bacteria-related issues. So, so we entire, cover the entire gamut. So, so we're looking at chemical factors, we're looking at uh, microbiological factors, and, we're also, and the well health check is also looking at physical parameters and, and some other information to really get it get a, uh, a check of the health of your well. And part of that is going to be uh, how, what, what is your, your situation for uh, corrosion ongoing in, in the well? So uh, both from, from a uh, indicators of, of galvanic corrosion, and that's usually gonna be something like, uh, you know, what's our dissolved oxygen? What is our iron two or, or our, our ferrous iron content in, in the well? Um, so, so we're going to, we're going to get a, a good snapshot. So I usually recommend a well health check once a year, uh, to, to have an understanding of the health of your well. It just gives you a snapshot at that point in time. You can monitor that over time. And, and what's important in any of these things is really tracking the trends because the trends are going to tell you what, what things are changing and you need to understand why they're changing. If your iron two concentrations are going up uh, on an annual basis, then you're then you're going to say we have an indicator of ongoing corrosion in your in our well, and we're going to have to look at that in a little bit more detail, and and maybe do it a little bit you know more detailed analysis of why that is. Maybe run a camera down there and 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 see what what ind indications we have going on. Run some chemistry and and uh, maybe some microbiological analysis and, and really look at that. So, so there's, there's a lot of value in that. It's not that expensive to do and for understanding what's going on in your well and maintaining a healthy well. A well is an expensive asset, so you want to maintain a healthy well and, and this is just part of that, that process. We want to understand the type of bacteria in the well, and I talked about that a little bit. Do you have uh, a high high amount of SRBs in the well? Uh, do we have acid-producing uh, bacteria? That that's another situation. So so understanding uh, the type of bacteria in the well, 
and the level of bacterial activity in the well will really tell you a lot about what's going on in your well and, and the potential for, for MIC going, going on in that well. And then um, as part of that, if, if, uh, if our numbers indicate we're getting to, to the danger level, and that's something you're going to track with, with your well health check, by, and, and the, the numbers there, you're going to put that into a dashboard and, and monitor that. Is it up or down? And we're going to reach a certain point where, where well rehabilitation is going to be indicated. You're going to want to rehab that well on a regular schedule or is indicated by, by your well health check process. And, and that's going to uh, really keep your potential for MIC to a, to a minimum. And by keeping that, that, those damaging bacteria under control, you'll never get rid of them. They'll come back eventually. But what you want to do is do an effective rehabilitation and knock those things back as far as possible. And, you know, we, we dive into well rehabilitation methods in, 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 in some of our classes. And, and we talk about that. And, and if you want to know more about that, uh, just reach out to me. I'll have my contact information here at, at the end. So, um, so this well rehab is really key towards controlling MIC in, in your well. So it's a little bit different approaches. Galvanic corrosion is really a monitoring situation. And, and, uh, um, and the, uh, the MIC is, is a monitoring situation as well. But, but galvanic corrosion is actually a design issue. So, so that's something we're going to look at up front as well. So, okay. Here's some information sources as we wrap up here. If you really want to do a deep dive into, into corrosion, uh, we'll have that class coming up after the first of the year, uh, and we'll, we'll dive into more detail and, and uh, really provide a lot of information, although I, I think I gave you a lot here. Um, but if, you, if you're looking for other information sources, the American Water Works Association uh, at, at www.awwa.org, um, they have a manual on corrosion and and uh, and some other information on the site. I believe they have like a online calculator for doing the the LSI. So so you can go there and check that out. Uh, the Association for Materials Protection and Performance, which uh, was formerly the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, probably a lot of people were familiar with NACE. Uh, that is, that's the new name for NACE. They're, they consolidated a couple organizations. So, so their whole goal is to deal with corrosion issues. And, and so a lot of information there. They have some, some high-end training on that. And, and so if you're, you're really interested in the ins and outs and nitty-gritty of corrosion, um, you'll be overwhelmed with the information on their site. There's a lot of good information there, but, but uh, some of their classes are, are pretty pricey. But... But uh, these are the guys that, uh, the engineers that belong to that are the guys that really specialize in, in, in corrosion and, and uh, they, they know their stuff. So, so that's, uh, that's the uh, URL to, to contact them and, and you can check them out. Okay, so for, for doing diagnostic testing, uh, we, we really, um, we'll, we'll do a lot of that through the well health check, but, but for a deeper dive on that well on that uh, corrosion testing and, and diagnostic testing. We highly recommend Water System Engineering in Ottawa, Kansas. Uh, we've worked with them quite a bit. They're great guys. They know their stuff. And, and they've been in this business for quite a while. Uh, we use them a lot for the microbiological analysis. And, and, and uh, uh, they really have that dialed in really well. They have a big database of of data they've collected. They work all on wells all over the United States and, and just a huge amount of data. So they're able to compare to their database what your situation is and, and make some recommendations. They've been working more on corrosion issues uh, the last few years and, and so so they really have some some engineering skill in that area. So so they they can kind of help you through that through that situation as well. So so we recommend we typically recommend doing a well health check where, where we pull them in anyway. And for further stuff in, in really doing a deeper dive on, on doing diagnostic testing for your corrosion issues, then, then you can just go direct to them and they're, 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 uh, they're the experts in that. So, all right, that's what I have for you today. Just a reminder again of our upcoming class uh, next week on on the well health check process. So since I mentioned it, we do have a class coming up where we go over that in great detail. Uh, I 
provided the information there at, at the beginning. And you can find us on, on that, that information on LinkedIn also under my profile. Um, you can contact me directly at tballard at groundwaterguy.com. Um, also tballard at sehydrogeology.com. That's my formal email address. But like I say, no, nobody remembers your company name. So, so groundwater guy is usually something people, people remember. So, um, we, we go live into every Thursday into our groundwater guy YouTube channel. So you can find us there. And so you can watch us there. We, we monitor the comments there. And, and that's probably the best place to find the, the, the past shows we've had, like last week's where we talked about bark testing. So, so that's, that's a great place to go to look up past shows. We maintain them all there. Um, here's my contact information on LinkedIn. This is my profile. We stream into that. So, so some of you that are watching live, I know Steve Steeg is watching live on, on LinkedIn. So, so there we go. I think he's on YouTube also. So he's multitasking. Uh, just looking at this here. So, so, but, but there, the LinkedIn is a great place to contact me. I post a lot up there and, and have information there on my profile. And certainly we live stream there as well. So, so you can watch, watch it there as well. So. All right. If, if you're, uh, if you're in the groundwater business, you're a vendor, you're a water system operator, and you want to come on the show and talk, we're, we're always interested in interesting stories and, and, and products that, that help people in the groundwater business. So, so I have a booking page. You can jump on there and, and schedule a slot to, to, to come on. We go every Thursday live uh, into LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, it's it's uh, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Central time, and we'd love to have you on. And lastly, if you're watching this on, on the recording, we really appreciate you posting comments, uh, even just likes, shares, comments, all help us uh, beat the algorithm as it were and, and get a wider distribution. So, so if you like, comment, share our posts and, and, and these live feeds, the recordings of these live feeds, that helps be poor, more people see them, we, gives us more exposure and, and, and broadens our reach as we will because our goal really here is to get useful information out to people and help people. Uh, like I say, we provide the classes that provide a little bit deeper dive and, and certification and credit. But we're trying with, with this show to really provide information that's, that's uh, uh, useful to people that they can kind of grab onto and it steers them kind of in the right direction. Okay, that's our show for today. We appreciate you watching. I am the Groundwater Guy signing out and we will see you next Thursday.